Hello, everybody. My name is Rob Packard. I'm the president of Medical Device Academy. Today's webinar is the seven steps to respond to an FDA 483 inspection observation. So FDA 43, that's just the form number. So that shouldn't scare you, but it's absolutely critical that you know exactly how to respond, you know exactly what should be in your response, and that you do it extremely quickly. And after you've seen this webinar today, you'll understand why. But once again, extremely important to know exactly how to respond, what to include in your response, and to do it quickly. And if you're interested in seeing the written version of this, uh, we also wrote a blog on this, and so the bit.ly link for that is at the bottom of the page here, and it'll take you to the blog specifically on how to respond to uh, FDA 43 inspection observations. So, step one, you must respond within 15 days. That is 15 business days, not calendar days, but business days. So if you're unsure, you got a holiday weekend in there, Make sure you clarify exactly what that 15 days is, but do not cut it close. Do not try to FedEx at 7 o'clock at night, the night before it's due. It, it's not a good idea because the response by the FDA when it's received late is an automatic warning letter. They don't even open up your letter. They just issue a warning letter. Here you go. Here's your warning letter. And now you have to respond to that. And the reason why is because they have... In, it used to be sort of a, it was the unofficial requirement of the FDA, but they made it official, and here's a link to the official legislation that made it law that the FDA shall issue an automatic warning letter if you respond late. And I've actually seen people be fired over this. Um, it's easy to do, you're really busy, spread thin, oh, I'll get it, oh, I lost track of the days, whoops, I got a warning letter, whoops, I'm fired. So don't do that. Number two, when you respond, the difference in a good between a good response and a poor response is potentially the difference between having an, a warning letter coming at you that you didn't know about versus having a warning letter that was coming at you get pulled back and the FDA says, no, we're not going to give it to them because this was a really outstanding re response and it's not necessary. People don't realize that when the FDA is there, they are not going to tell you whether there's official action indicated or there's voluntary indica action indicated or there's no action indicated. They keep that close to the vest because they don't want to be perceived as harassing. That gets them in trouble when you go to court. So if there's any indication that they've been holding over your head, will you get a warning letter if you don't do this? They, then they get into trouble. So they keep it very close to the vest exactly what the status of the investigation is during the investigation. And you don't even get to see that EIR, the uh, electronic inspection report that the FDA has until everything's all done. So you need to know exactly how to respond and what makes a really good response that's going to get you out of trouble before you even realize you're in it. The timing is absolutely critical. The FDA may be late. There is no way that the FDA is going to respond within 15 business days with a warning letter. If they did, they would be picking up the phone during lunch out on their car and say, please get me some people down here with some guns to close this place down. So if you're that bad off, they're not even going to bother waiting for letters. They're going to get some, some other investigators there, and they're going to come in with more help. But in most cases, if you're due for a warning letter, the warning letter is going to come after the 15 business days. So this response that you submit for your FDA 43 is your last chance to avoid that official action. You want to do that. Um, if the FDA feels that there's urgent uh, public health issues, they're going to act more urgently. But oftentimes the issues that get people into trouble and result in warning letters are things like CAPA systems are poorly maintained. Um, we're reporting things, we're, we're reporting them late. Uh, we didn't spend a 510K for a modification we should have. These are not things that are going to result in, in uh, immediate public risk. And so the FDA could easily take six months. And if we're talking about an inspection that's done in, in the uh, late summer, early fall, you're almost guaranteed it's coming after the new year because there's nobody at the FDA in December. It's a use it or lose it vacation policy and everybody's gone in December. 
So make sure you get the, your responses in early and also we're going to teach you some other things you can do to head it off even after the 15 day uh, responses in. Step two, when you respond, how you respond, the format and content is something a lot of people that are new to this, they, they panic over, they don't know what to submit. How do I, what form do I use? So well, I'll look on the FDA website and they find nothing. And so they talk to some people and somebody says, well, write a memo to them. And that's what the language was that the, the inventor used to write a memo explaining how we're going to respond to each of these findings in the 483. Well, I've talked to a lot of FDA inspectors and ex-FDA investigators, and what they say is you want a cover letter, and then you want behind that is supporting evidence your CAPO form for each and every one of the findings that was issued by the FDA. So if you have five findings on your five, uh, form FDA 43, then you want those five CAPO forms behind that. And a memo staying in the front, like this is a response to your FDA 43 that we received on this date as a result of this inspection, and we have a, initiated the following CAPO numbers, and those were attached or enclosed with this letter. It doesn't need to be a long letter, very short, very professional, just the facts. The key is to use your CAPA form because if you have a well-designed CAPA form, it's going to have all the information that the investigator needs to evaluate and say, yes, the response is adequate or no, it's not. And you're also going to have these 43 responses reviewed by um, the division office as well. So it's not just going to be the investigator, it's both are reviewing it and deciding whether it's adequate. Uh, particularly if it's a more junior person that doesn't have the experience. So it's absolutely critical that you use your CAPA forms for this because otherwise you might forget something that's really important. Um, many of the warning letters will indicate failure to correct all issues found. So that's one of the, the first things you see is like the, your response to the FDA 43 was inadequate because you didn't respond to the following issues. You didn't correct them. You're correcting, you're preventing them from reoccurring, but you're not correcting the ones that already occurred, and you have to correct them. So they're expecting non-conforming material reports, they're expecting quarantine, they're expecting rework or scrapping, or even a recall. And you could also have a failure to initiate corrective actions to prevent reoccurrence. So you corrected the problem, but you didn't prevent it from reoccurring. So that would be the other way. So either either the correction piece or the corrective action piece, a lot of companies forget. And if you're not sure about these terms, you don't understand what a CAPA form looks like, you don't know all the elements of a CAPA, this is probably why you're viewing this and you've got a 43 because your CAPA system is inadequate or you don't have an adequate CAPA procedure. So you might want to look at this actual CAPA webinar here that focuses on just how to respond to any CAPA, not just from the FDA, but also from your notified body or internal audits. Here are some elements that are supposed to be in your CAPA form. So we actually wrote a, a blog about what should be in CAPA form, but here are the elements that should be in it. And it's fairly lengthy. Well, that's important. And probably one of the more important things here that people don't realize is provide enough room. Do not use a paper-based form that you, you don't have enough room for. If you don't have enough room, use the paper-based form if that's what you're stuck with for right now until you can improve it. Right? See attached form <laughs> or see attached memo, something like that. So you are providing enough information and it's, it's in a format that's clearly legible and you've got everything adequately addressed. That's absolutely important to make sure you have enough room to get the information out there and it's well organized. And here's all these other things that you're supposed to include as well. But this is not a capital course. This is how to respond to your 43. So if you have any problems with any of these things here, um, make sure you look at this CAPA form uh, and also consider the CAPA letter. Here's an example of one possible CAPA process that you might consider. Uh, this uh, usually when we talk about 8Ds, we're talking about the automotive industry. But as they indicated in this slide, it wasn't actually developed by the automotive industry. They like to think they did, but it wasn't developed by the automotive industry. It actually comes goes all the way back to the Minuteman program, I believe, and during World War II. Um, and so we're we're talking about, or actually even before that, I think. So we're talking about this military standard, 1520. This is way back. So we're talking over 
50 years old is the AD process. And I've heard a lot of companies say, well, we do an AD-like process, but we, we drop this AD here, this uh, recognizes him. We don't need to tap people on the back because it's a very good job in their cap. But I think a lot of people don't understand the, the concept of what an AD is and why they use AD sometimes. Uh, when you have an AD team selected, you've got an automotive plant shut down. You're being charged hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour for the line being shut down. You've got uh, massive expenses, people out of work that are unionized. Um, you've got no shipments are able to be made. You've got extreme expenses to repair this. And all for a validated process that had should have been bulletproof and you never should have been able to make a bad part. So something went wrong that was totally unanticipated and should not have been possible. And so this is not going to be a trivial action. This is going to need a team of cross-functional team to figure out how this happened and prevent it from ever occurring again. Because if it happens again, you probably won't be the supplier for that automotive company anymore. So that's why they're recognizing the team. That's why they talk about a team and they emphasize that in the AD process. Hopefully your FDA 483 is not talking about that size of problem. But there are some fantastic elements in the AD process that are emphasized that are that you should be aware of and I think are best practices that could be applied. One of them is containment actions. So if you if you look at how they contain things in the automotive industry and what extreme measures they go to, that's really important. And you're also looking at um, verifying effective corrective actions. You want to verify that the corrective, you, it actually does what it's supposed to. So you try to recreate the problem and see if the new solution you put in place actually prevents it. So those are two of the elements, but the AT process is a very strong process. The only complaint I might have is it might be overkill for your problem, but it's a great process to model your, your uh, CAPA process after, particularly when it's the FDA that's involved here. The other thing that I think I, I like about the AT process is a lot of times the automotive customers are saying, I want an AD in our office by 8 a.m. tomorrow. You're given off in 24 hours to put together a, pre a preliminary plan. That's the kind of urgency you want when you're responding to 43. So how do you document your root cause investigation? That's one of the key elements in step three of the process. So you're going to use your CAPA form. You're going to assign an investigator. Um, and, and you get to start documenting this investigation so you can determine what the cause is and, and suggest some corrective actions and give the FDA a plan. And this may sound trivial, like, oh, big deal. I, you know, I've, so what, I've never heard this before. Who, what, where, when, why, how. I've never heard that before. But if you look at the 483s and the warning letters, a lot of them are for you're missing this. So if you have a 43 and it's for the capital process, look really closely at how you documented your root cause investigation or investigation of, of what happened that caused the, the issue. Did you assign a team member to do the investigation? Did you document who that was on the form? What did they investigate? So you didn't tell me what forms they sampled, what procedures, what processes, what machines, uh, what plant did the investigation occur in? Did you look at it only where the investigator originally found the problem, or did you expand the scope a little bit? Um, when did you investigate it? Did you go back? I see a lot of warning letters that say they failed to go back to previous years. They only dealt for the last six months, and that wasn't adequate. What about all the product that's in the field that might need to be recalled? And then you get to why did it happen and how did it happen? So this is where a lot of people start and they miss all these other things that need to be documented. And a lot of times it's not, the problem is not that it wasn't done. People are pretty smart and know how to do these investigations, but what they really don't do a great job of is documenting it. So that's why this title is How to Document. It's important here that you document each of these things. So when you respond to a 43 and you have a section on investigation, you might want to consider attaching an investigation report instead of trying to fit it all in that little space and, and actually say who, what, where, when, why, and how in that report. That's a great idea just to make sure you're thorough. 
a lot of companies out there don't have adequate root cause analysis training tools. And I've actually seen some companies that specify on the CAPA form that they shall use only this one tool. It's a different tool every time. Sometimes I see the fishbone diagrams. Uh, these are also called cause and effect or Ishikawa diagrams. Other times I see you shall use a 5Y analysis. Uh, I've heard is is not used as a couple different names. Sometimes it's a Pareto analysis. A lot of people don't even know what an affinity diagram is. So you need to know what each of these tools are, when to use them. And I, I tell you, when I'm doing a real investigation of something, a lot of times I'm not using just one of these tools. I'm using multiple tools. I might start out with it is is not because I have no idea why it's occurring or how or where or why. And once I've narrowed it down a little bit, then I might get into a fishbone diagram because I know where to focus. Um, another tool I might use is a Pareto analysis and figure out, well, I know there are five different things going wrong simultaneously here. Let's figure out which one's biggest and focus on that. So that's another thing you might want to consider is a root cause analysis. Learn these different tools really, really well. And I do go through these in much more detail in the CAPA course. I'm going to cover on this one just, just for a second because I see this one referenced so much and I see it done correctly almost never. In this example that I've used here, I actually pulled right out of a training course that I took on root cause analysis that I thought was phenomenal. Um, it was only a webinar, but it actually was interactive and it did a really great job of explaining the 5Y analysis. I'm not so sure it did such a great job of some of the other techniques, but it did a fantastic job of this particular technique and I really liked it. So why are tires blowing out at 20,000 miles? It was using an example of um, of one of the automotive companies that was having a recall for tires blowing and killing people. And one of the answers, or the answer was, well, the sidewalls are thin. So the next why, the second why is why are the sidewalls too thin? They're below specification in some places and how should that be possible? Well, it turns out the calipers they were using to measure them were out of tolerance. So they were measuring okay, but they weren't actually okay. So why are the calipers out of tolerance is the third why. And it turns out it's because a technician that was performing the calibration used the incorrect procedure for calibration. These are brand new calibers. They were supposed to use a special technique for calibrating these very sophisticated semi-automated uh, calipers. And they didn't use that technique. So why didn't they use the proper technique? Why did they use an old version of their procedure? And it turns out it was because they had just laid off somebody in human resources and they didn't have somebody to replace them. So they fell behind on training records and they didn't realize that the procedure had been revised, but the people that were moving from one department to another were not getting trained. So there was a hole in the training documentation and tracking who needed what training. And so somebody slipped through the cracks and it resulted in a recall that cost a lot of money and some lives. So look at all the things that went wrong. We measured it incorrectly, we weren't calibrating correctly, we weren't using the right version of the procedure, and we don't have a transition plan for uh, when an HR person is laid off. Well, which one do I fix? Which one is the root cause? So this is what a 5Y analysis is really good for. It's getting into the depth of a problem. But you also need to look at breadth, and that's one of the things the FDA comments on as being inadequate. So this is just one tool. Some of the other tools, particularly I like the, um, the fishbone diagram, does a much better job of breadth. So you want to use more than one tool and know when to use them. Here's a statement talking about breadth. And this, this is one of the fundamental differences between the QSR 21 CFR 820 and uh, ISO 1345 or ISO 9001. ISO 9001 and 1345 have two clauses at the, at the end called 8.5.2 and 8.5.3. 8.5.2 is corrective action. 8.5.3 is preventive action. The FDA does not segregate these two concepts. They always use the term corrective and preventive action. Like it was a phrase that was all jumbled together in one word. Corrective and preventive action, or a kappa. And so I had the pleasure of taking a kappa course with AMI and Kim Troutman was the FDA speaker there, and she's the person who helped write the, um, the QSR and helped sit on the committee for 1345 as the FDA representative and had a lot of input on how CAPAs are done. And her comment was, 
a good corrective and preventive action also addresses potential for the same failure on other components, processes, and products. And she always uses the example of you did a really great job of investigating on this product line, but the product line right next to it, the machines right next to it are running the same kind of product, the same kind of process, and they have the exact same problem, and you ended up with a recall the following week on that line. So you didn't do an adequate job of preventive action. You had a problem over here, you corrected it, implemented corrective action, but you didn't implement preventive action over on other product lines with the same potential. Now, the the ISO folks are purists and they feel that you know if you already had a finding over here then it's not really preventive. That doesn't mean you shouldn't implement preventive actions over on that line. Whatever you're going to call them doesn't really matter. Look at breadth. Look at other product lines where the same kind of problem could occur. Don't forget correction and containment. So one of the most common things I see in those warning letters where they're saying the response is inadequate is they're forgetting to include correction and containment. So this is step four of your 483 response. You want to make sure you identify each of the items the FDA are found wrong, and I recommend bulleting them or itemizing them one, two, three, four for each of the things the FDA had. Put them in quotes and then right next to them, maybe in a tabular format would be a great way to do it, FDA uh, issue found, correction implemented. So you could have two columns, a nice table, make it crystal clear. Here was all the things you found in your report for the FDA 43 inspection report, and here's all the things that we did to correct the problem. Also, you're, you need to contain the problem. So if the FDA finds product that's mislabeled, if you don't take immediate containment measures while the FDA is still there, that's not a good thing. They're expecting you, even though they're not going to tell you to, but they're expecting you to contain that product they've just found is mislabeled. They expect you to issue a non-conforming material report. They expect you to put reject stickers on it. They expect you to move it to a locked cage. Now, it doesn't have to be locked. It doesn't have to have a red sticker on it. But whatever your procedure is and process is for non-conforming materials, you better be implementing it real time very quickly because the FDA just found some mislabeled product that could result in a re recall. Uh, same thing for defective components. Whatever it is, implement containment right away. That should also carry through to your response because you want to look, just like Kim says, where else could the problem be? Could it be in product that's in the field? Could it be on other product lines? Where else do we use this component? Rather than just this product line, we use it on 12 other product lines where we could have the same problem. Yes, it may be painful, but you want to make sure you implement your containment measures outside as well. And you want to act quickly, but don't miss anything. So yes, you want to act while the FDA is still there, but you also want to go back and make sure we've gotten it all before you send your response. So one of your top primary issues, if you have non-conforming material and they've identified and you're containing it, make sure you've bounded or bracketed the problem adequately. And if you can't identify what caused it and when it happened, then you're going to have to use some statistical method for determining what the bounding should be. So that's when you might call into play uh, 21 CFR 820.250, statistical techniques requirement. And you're supposed to have a procedure for that. So for those of you that aren't clear on what correction versus corrective action is, this is one of the areas where a lot of companies get into trouble. They implement one or the other, and they seem to forget about the other completely. So it's really important you understand the difference between correction and corrective action. So here's the definitions here for correction and corrective action to help clarify things for you. Containment. So here is more of a definition of containment. And one of the key things here that they would expect you to be implementing is your non-conforming material process. So if you're only dealing with the FDA and QSR and you don't sell anything in Europe or Canada, it might be uh, 21 CFR 820.90 is the uh, applicable section of the QSR that you should be looking at for control of non-conforming material. And so the other pieces you want to be looking at are the FDA regulations for recalls because you might have to worry about product that's in the field. You bound it and you realize, well, we already shipped some of that. So withdrawing products from sale, products from distribution, giving advice to customers. So should we pull the implant out of the person or not? Um, 
and physical return and destruction of things should be covered. So all these things are containment measures. And I give you the reference here for the ISO standard where they talk about it. But there's also FDA regulations. And if you want a webinar on FDA recalls, a lot of companies really just do not know what to do on this because they don't do wet recalls every day, thank goodness. But um, it's nice to have an FDA, ex-FDA inspector on your team, like Medical Device Academy, and we're able to tap into uh, Leo LeBrot, and he's been able to help us uh, fine-tuning our recall uh, procedures and techniques. And so we've got a really nice webinar for people out there explaining exactly what to do. And about two days after I recorded that, I had a call from a customer that needed help. And the example of the problem that they were having, I actually gave in my training. Um, it was coincidental because it's one of the most common problems, labeling errors. So if you're interested in the FDA recalls webinar, click on the link down there. If you're looking at the uh, regulations for recall and want to know, well, the FDA issued a 43, do I need to recall? Do I need to report the recall? Here are the regulations you want to be looking up, specifically 21 CFR 806. And this is one a lot of people won't look at is 21 CFR Part 7, and it's the subpart C uh, that talks about recalls. So this is the what the FDA does to enforce these. And this is what you're supposed to be doing in terms of executing the recall and reporting it and determining the risks. We also have recall classification. So this is in that 21 CFR uh, part or subpart 7.3 G. And then we actually have this class one, class two, class three. And it's the reverse of what you expect for classification of devices. For devices, a class three device is high risk. For recalls, class three is a very low risk. And so we, if you read these long definitions, and I know all of you can read, so we won't do that to you now, but if you read these definitions, you'll understand class one is the high risk and class three is the low risk. And a lot of times the class threes, you don't have to report. You have to make sure you know how to determine that and when. If you're looking for um, guidance from the FDA, the FDA actually has a guidance document for FDA recalls, so here's a link for that. And it talks about three different things, the recall submission, the public notification, and the evaluation of the recall. And I, I can't emphasize enough the value of this document because when I say section A is recall submission, it goes on for more than a page about recall submissions, and then another page or more on this. So it's a fairly long document with a lot of detail. These are just the titles of the sections, and then they go on very in-depth into what's required. Uh, the other thing that you're going to need to know is recall coordinators. Who do you who do you contact the FDA to notify them of a problem? And foreign firms actually are a lot of times when they look online, they they see oh 80358 says that we have to have an official U.S. agent to notify the FDA. But what they don't realize is that regulation was actually stayed. So what that means is the FDA rescinded that or put it on hold and it doesn't apply at this time and it's it's indefinitely on hold. So it will not apply and hasn't applied since 1996. Um, so if you are a foreign firm, it's not that you shouldn't or can't use an official U.S. agent. It's, not, it's that it's not required to. So if you're a fairly large organization, know how to implement a uh, recall, and you're a foreign firm, you do not need to have an official U.S. agent, though you may choose to. Um, the other thing that's important to understand here is if you are a foreign firm, you're going to be reporting to headquarters for the FDA. And if you're a U.S. domestic firm, you're going to be reporting to your regional uh, coordinator rather than the U.S. headquarters. Step five, your corrective action plan. And this is where everybody wants to jump in. We're going to fix the problem. But... Um, it's really important that you do steps one through four before you get to here, otherwise step five will be addressing the wrong problems. And coincidentally here, what do we see again? Who, what, where, when. So these are, you don't really need to explain the why anymore because the why is because what the root cause is. So if you've identified the root cause, that's the why, and then who, what, where, when is what we're going to be implementing for corrective actions. And one of the key things that has to be in your plan here is ensure the timeline, timelines are realistic. 
you don't want to sandbag because the FDA isn't going to be happy about you saying it's going to take three years to implement this simple corrective action. But at the same time, if you say it's going to take me 12 months and they come back in 18 months and you're still not done, that's going to be a problem. And this, this takes you into a little bit more detail about what is it a corrective action. So it's eliminating the cause of the detected nonconformity or undesirable situation. That's the definition of ISO, in ISO 9000, section 3.6.5. And then there's some notes here. So you can have more than one cause. Um, a corrective action is taken to prevent recurrence, where whereas a preventive action, so it tells the difference between corrective and preventive. And there's a distinction between correction and corrective action, which we've already covered in previous slide. Now, this is the part, step six, that I almost see no companies ever do. Um, and this is really important. And when you look at those warning letters, you will see this over and over and over again. Show you have already taken action. There are two times you want to be doing this. There's actually three, but we're going to cover the first two right now. During the inspection. Oh, yes, sir. We're going to put that on hold right away, sir. Here's the NCR for that, sir. Yes, that's how you want to be. You want to immediately contain the product, put it under non-conforming material. And even though we always say, you know, you don't volunteer things for the FDA that they haven't asked for, but if they find non-conforming product and you know it's going to be written up as a 483, it will actually help you to implement a non-conforming material report right away and quarantine the product and show the FDA evidence of that in the form of a record. Why? Because then they can say in the report the company took action during the inspection. So that's good for whether you're an ISO, you're in the middle of an ISO audit, a customer audit, or the FDA. It's always good to take action immediately and not, you know, I've actually seen companies, I, I've had been out there on the floor doing an audit, they have non-conforming material product, and they're like, okay, and they expect me to just keep on going. And I'm like, aren't you going to do something about it? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're still running the line, and I just identified the product's non-conforming. What good is it if it's all non-conforming? <laughs> Stop the line. Uh, and they, some companies are thinking crazy, but I expect companies to stop the line if they're running with no good product. Uh, it's bad raw materials, garbage in, garbage out. Why I keep on running it? Stop the line. And the second place you want to show you've already taken action is during the 15 business days. You do not want to give the FDA the impression that we're going to get to it when we get to it. You want to get, give the FDA the impression it's only been 15 business days, but, but we've already done a whole bunch, and here's the evidence of it. We've already revised the procedures, we've already trained some people, we've already implemented it. We haven't had a chance to do an effectiveness check, but we're like 90% done with our plan already. That's the impression you want to give them. And how you show them is key. So showing, you know, the FDA only has a little bit of time and they can only review so many of these reports. So, you know, that, that old adage, a pitcher tells a thousand words. So if you the issue is, let's say, line clearance, and you have mix-ups of product labeling out there that result in a recall, wouldn't it be nice to have a picture of, here was our really disorganized labeling controls system that we had before, and here's how it is now. Night and day difference, well-organized, well-labeled, segregated, identified, best practices in how to organize your warehouse to keep labels segregated and prevent mix-ups. That would be beautiful to have a picture before and after as part, not as the whole thing, but as part of the way of demonstrating the FDA what corrective actions you've already implemented. And so showing them is really powerful. And any, any response that comes back with pictures is going to get a little bit more attention. And attention of that kind is a good thing. Um, if it's stuff that they found and you didn't, that's not so good a kind of attention. And here's the third type of showing the FDA what you're doing. Typically, the FDA comes back in two years, sometimes longer. But if it, there's a 43 report, they may come back sooner. Uh, one of the questions I recently asked uh, Leo LeGroote during an interview I had with him, we posted on our website, if you have a 
um, if you have the FDA coming, let's say you're located down in um, in Tampa where he was located, or you're out in California, if you're given uh, even voluntary action, you might have an FDA inspection more frequent because there's an action to follow up. So you might have them coming back every year instead of every two years. So in those situations, the FDA is going to come back. If you said it's going to take you nine months to implement corrective actions and you expect them back in two years and they come back in a year, if you've been slow in implementing those corrective actions, you're going to have a problem. So you want to make sure that the FDA is confident that you've implemented corrective actions and you might be able to head off that earlier visit date. So instead of getting annual visits, because there's 43s to follow up on, they might delay and go on a normal schedule because you sent them evidence that you finished the corrective actions. So not just the initial 43 response, but a follow-up report to them saying, it's nine months later, it's six months later, and we've implemented the corrective actions, and here's the evidence of it. Once again, great opportunity for pictures, but fully executed procedures, training records, and an effectiveness check. I'll talk about more about effectiveness checks, but it's really important to think about this follow-up here because they might be planning on coming in to do an inspection to follow up and if you send them the information you might stave off an early inspection visit. That's always nice. Uh, so once again, timing is important to visual if you can in your response and that's step seven. The documentation you want to provide the FDA, so whether this is the documentation that you're doing in the initial 43 response or any of the follow-up, uh, paper files are auditor friendly. So when the FDA comes back, you want to have paper files for them to look at, even if your whole system is electronic. Um, you want to include copies or attach electronic records of the investigation, containment, corrections. This is all the documentation you want in place in your CAPA system so you can go grab it and answer any of the FDA's questions. Ideally, they're getting a folder and everything they need in, is in there so they don't need to ask for any more documentation. If you have any changes to your action plan, it's okay. You you dug in, you were investigating, you started implementing, you realized you know what we had planned was not the best solution, even though that's what we told the FDA we were going to do. It's okay to make a change to your plan. You just need to explain it and document it clearly. If you have extensions, and sometimes that's necessary, okay, justify the extensions. What's not okay is 12 extensions in a row with no progress in between. If you have progress in between each one and you have one or two extensions and they're for really good reasons like we had to redesign the mold for that part, we redesigned the mold, it failed the validation or requalification of the new tooling and so therefore we had to have a second extension. You know, Those would be two really good reasons for why you have to have extensions. And it shows you're doing the right things. And then have somebody independently review this with the, with the mindset of is there something that's said in here that really is, is not professional or appropriate. Uh, you, the purpose of this documentation is not to point blame. The purpose of this documentation is to just state the facts. So be very careful how you word things. For the effectiveness checks, when you follow up and show the FDA effectiveness checks before they come back, the documentation here has to has to be very conclusive that yes, this will never happen again. And a lot of companies they will re-audit things. That's one approach. Unfortunately, not a lot of auditors are very good at that. They don't tend to sample enough records. Uh, they don't look for other the problem in other departments or other product lines, so they don't look at the breadth. They aren't very good at five Y analysis, so they don't go deep enough. Um, you could do a desktop on it, but that's not always effective. Verification validation reports tend to be outstanding effectiveness checks, though. So if you're looking for what would be a really great thing to use in this effectiveness check, a process verification or a design verification or a process validation report would be fantastic because these have acceptance criteria in them, and you have to have met the acceptance criteria to close it out. So that's a great uh, solution for an effectiveness check. You don't have to wait any longer than once you complete the report and it meets the acceptance criteria. You could use things like supervisor evaluations uh, for, you know, operator made a mistake and we retrain them. However, that usually is, you didn't, the, the conclusion that most good auditors and the FDA are going to have are, you didn't really do a 5 y analysis, you didn't go deep enough, 
to figure out why the person's training was not adequate. Um, either you didn't qualify the person, uh, you have people in there that shouldn't be in the job, or the training's not adequate or not effective. So these are the kinds of things that we include. And doing a supervisor evaluation is very subjective. So that's not what I recommend, but it's an option. Another tool is quizzes. So this is something I do a lot of for all the training. I, any training course that I offer, any webinars that you, I have, if you're interested in receiving a certificate of training effectiveness, I provide uh, multiple choice and fill in the blank exams. And then I grade those, and even if people guessed, I give them back the corrected answers. So this is why this is the right answer. This is why this is the wrong answer. And they have to score at least a 70. And I don't make trivial exams. I give you exams that force you to do a little bit of homework and read and think and go back and look at the standards. Because that way I know they're getting beyond just what I gave in the webinar. They have to do a little homework, too. The best possible things you can do for effectiveness checks, except maybe for verification validation reports, would be these two. Whenever you can come up with something quantitative, you can set the acceptance criteria ahead of time and say, I, we're going to start graphing this as a quality objective, or this is going to be a metric that we're going to follow, or we're going to have to meet this new performance criteria. And you start measuring. What gets measured gets done. So if you, if you have a metric, that's one of the best tools for effectiveness checks. And then if you have enough data that you're gathering over a short period of time, you can actually close these kappas out faster. Oh, one last thing. If you're interested in kappa effectiveness checks, here's a, a uh, blog on that. Talking about the metrics and measuring things and quality objectives, here is one of the tools you ought to consider is trend analysis. This is also useful for doing investigations. You do a trend to figure out when it occurred. And so if you aren't familiar with this type of chart, this is a uh, SPC run chart. It shows you uh, the mean. It shows you the range of the process. It shows you uh, whether it's a, a normal distribution of product uh, results or not. Uh, they've indicated some key data points here, right here. And you can tell up above, you know, this is an XPR chart, but they have all these other types of charts. So if this is all foreign to you, you need to beef up your statistics training. Or maybe you're not the right person uh, that deals with this kind of things. Maybe it's a quality engineer in your organization that deals with it. But everybody could use a little bit more statistics whenever they're dealing with campus because they're great tools for showing it's effective. Uh, statistics can always be made to lie, but they, they definitely are a lot stronger than supervisor evaluations. Going back to the other option, of the first option I had there, which was do an audit. If you're going to re-audit for effectiveness, make sure you're doing a really good audit of it. And so one of the things I look for is do they do a process approach audit. The reason why I say process approach, process approach uh, is a systematic approach to auditing where you're where you're looking at the linkages to other processes. And that's really important. It's not did you just do this right, but what other things could this have affected? So if you have your, it's a seven-step approach. Um, you have your uh, definition of the process and talking to the process owner to describe it. You have your inputs, your outputs, what equipment and facilities you use, what people are doing the work, what forms and procedures you have, and then your quality metrics or uh, quality objectives that you're gathering for the process to know whether it's effective and maybe uh, identify proactively what problems are occurring before they occur. And if you're interested in more training on what the process approach is, there's a link there to a webinar I taught on it. 